you, you better. This guy says we're pivot. You understand just how we living. This for me is like rap religion. Open on B cause we got this Skype. When it come to this, y'all, I can get it hype. When it come to this, y'all, calm has risen. How you living, huh? Yo, how you living, pivot? I feel like you got you were more ambitious in that way earlier than I was because all of a sudden I look up and you're directing right. and you're directing an episode of Entourage. Did that give you a different perspective on the show, us, the process, anything? Well, I mean, I, you know, one of the things I think, you know, directors will tell you, it's, it's really knowing your, it's like, oh, being a head, it's like being a head coach, right? It's like knowing your team. Yeah. Right? Like with you, for example, like I would look, at a script and I, you usually would have like, I would be able to ID your big scene or one that's like, all right, this is, and then I would have a conversation like, Hey, what, what, what do you think? You want to do this in the morning? I want to try to do that. You know? So everybody has different needs and wants. And I think if you, you communicate, that was one of the things that I, I understood. I felt like I knew everybody. So I could talk, like I, I always tell the story, you know, I'm the one that I'm the one, like, you know, when I, when Jerry started his weight loss journey, my episode, I cut, I cut the sleeves. I cut those sleeves off personally. I cut his sleeves off. I made him tuck his shirt in, yeah. oiled down the arms, yeah. threw up a top light <laughs> and said, he said, I don't know. I'm ready for the tuck. I said, oh, you're ready for the tuck. We're going, we're, we're going. <laughs> we're so going. you had everyone's back. You just, or, or you just think of, yeah, you want to be able to, you know, you got to know your, you got to know your, your, your cast, you know? I remember there was one moment where I had to, to lose it on Carla Gugino, who was so brilliant. It was Vin, one of it's Vince's agents. Wolfgang's. Yeah. It's that Wolfgang Pucks, right? Yeah. And so I had to really, you know, go off on her and, you know, we're all friends with Carla and she's just such a genius and she's so amazing. And, and she ages backwards as well, by the way, which is strange. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we're all in denial of our age. <laughs> and, you know, um, so, but I remember I had to like lean into her and go off on her. And, you know, there were a lot of, uh, extras, uh, background artists. Restaurant art. full of background artists. Yeah, indeed. Um, and every time I would lose an honor, they would all just start laughing. Right. And it was very interesting because I, I, I didn't, I got frustrated at the time. Right. Because, you know, in, and you would really like, you would I'm break dig, it down. I'm, for I'm us. digging here, deep here. I'm here's the scenario here. and you'd right. break it down for us. You know, we're in a public place. This guy is losing it. It's uncomfortable and whatever. And sure enough, every time I would do it, they would laugh. And it was almost like doing a live performance right. or a, a play version or a stand up version they of were Ari Gold. In the moment. <laughs> As they were, yeah, they, they were, they were had a, a, that scene in particular. I mean, it's basically Ari Gold drunk, yelling at 20, <laughs> yelling at a, at a table full of people. And the whole idea is that it's, it's packed. It's a packed restaurant. So while they're there, they're, you know, they're extras to them. They got a ringside seat. But what's so interesting about that. And people want to know the difference between film and TV if if that was Tony Montana, by the way, I'm not comparing myself to Al Pacino in any way, shape, or form. Right. I'm just saying, when Tony Montana loses it and say goodbye to the bad guy, and and all the extras are there, he's not on TV. Right. Um, it's a new character, and everyone is taking that in for the first time and it's horrifying right. you know what i mean and with me because they have a reference for this character and i've been in their living rooms for all that time right. it's they the funny laughing and they were applauding and it was like the take would end and they were like clapping i'm like okay because <laughs> <laughs> <Is anybody else watching? laughs> like, you know like i'm watching you know i'm watching you right like i'm not i'm trying not to focus on background but like the take the one take ended and they everybody started clapping i'm like guess that's good that they like the take but i don't know that the background artist should have been clapping right. Be, right. Be, because there's so many traps i can't then start playing to them right you know what i mean it's not that's not the exchange at all none of that serves us the reality is looking back you know it's flattering that they were uh it, Oh, so appreciative right and we're really that was all real they, their response it was inappropriate but it's interesting because they cut my favorite line in the scene which i i pitched to you you were like all right i'll do one uh, whatever you didn't think it was terribly amusing but you're like you're walking out and the last thing you say is you turn around and you say to the maid of the day yeah and you're not the real wolf gang <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. That's funny. That's Doug's right. Like I don't know. I don't get it. I'm like, let's joke. It's, he's not the real Wolfgang. And Doug's like, no, no, no. That's that. That's gone. I got gone. Um, but uh, yeah, no. It was. It was. Oh, it was always fun. And 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 of course, everybody was great. But I, I always had the. You know, it was always fun with you know, at, when to direct the show with like you or Dylan to like, yeah, look, we got it. And, one out there where you just like you know, let it let it fly you know what i mean or yeah. you know um that was that was always so fun to me right you know the freebie just, or whatever uh, or i just like lo- that was just you know i loved all that it's funny because i don't know if you know this but one time we, we had so many like surreal drop-ins that never happened at one point pacino i don't know if you know this but pacino showed up on set yeah and he just said so so it's a series right yeah when does it end <laughs> you know he That's could he didn't understand the concept of a series and ironically Be- that was the episode was dog day afternoon did you know that oh, fuck we were shooting dog oh, day afternoon when he was there he signed the script for doug That's but amazing. i mean ironically the day he showed up that was the day we were shooting dog day. what are the odds i mean and and here's a guy who you know he's one of the biggest legends ever we've watched all of his performances we've been inspired by him our whole lives and he literally not being pretentious doesn't understand the concept of a series and it's so intimidating to him he just like when does it end when does it he just it's it's so frightening to me and then of course joe pesci that we talked about that was great yeah there was there was yeah, there was a bunch of those. That was that's that was a, that was a great one. The, I, I wasn't there. I mean, it's crazy that I missed that one. I Kyle, missed do you do you it. know? And I I know you know this story, but I don't know if people that listen to my podcast know that Joe Pesci showed up on set, and I'm a huge fan, man, and I, and I'm kind of inspired that he's there. I don't know why he's there. Um, like who it, brought him here? <laughs> right. Like what, what is, what is his connection to right. anyone? Right. You know, on, in Culver city on this How show, is he here? This, this it's, show. it's, it's genius. And, you know, so you start thinking, is it a mistake? Did he wander in? Is he really here? What's going on in the moment? Lloyd brings in a, a couple of police officers and I don't know what's going on. And they put a boombox down and they tie me up and they're strippers. Okay. And um, we're simply rehearsing. Mark Maillard, who's, a, who's one of the, one, it was, I don't even know if he gets enough credit for, he was just such a good director. I mean, on, on still so works. many, still works. so many different yes. levels. Yes. And speaking of my brother, Adam McKay, um, is working with him on Succession, a little show called a Succession. Show called Succession. <sighs> Be good. How do you feel about Succession? You love it. I love it. Uh, huge, huge, huge fan. So Mark, Mark is is directing this episode, and you know we're just kind of talking about it and going through the numbers. And there are these two very uh, ripped gentlemen in 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 kind of banana hammocks. You know they 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 strip off all their clothes, and one of them uh is here and another one's here and we're just trying to trying to figure out the blocking. And I'm tied up, and you know Ari Gold most likely you know, is, is not a fan of male strippers. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to, to tap into that moment. And all of a sudden I hear, what, what are you doing? No, no, you want to, okay, look at me. And I look up and Joe Pesci's there and Joe Pesci starts directing the scene and Mark is there, but Mark's now letting Joe Pesci and I haven't met him yet. And I don't know why he's there. And I'm thinking, is Joe, is Joe Pesci co-directing this? Is he, what's, what's happening right now? And he goes, now put, put it in his face. And I'm tied up and I'm, I'm sorry. Put it in his face. Slap him. Slap him in the face. And this gentleman starts slapping his cock into my face. More. Slap him in his face. In his face. Come on. What is, and I'm looking up and it was, um, I started getting a bit queasy <laughs> because it was, you know, and I started getting dizzy and I don't know what's going on. I never saw Joe Pesci again. Right. You didn't even get that. That was it. <laughs> Well, I've Joe, never seen him again. I don't know why with, he was there. He was friends with the stripper. Guy, he was right? friends actors, with one of the, the one actor. of the gentlemen, one of the actors playing the stripper, and wanted him to, to put his entire power source and slap me in the face repeatedly. And it was all very confusing. And that was my only moment. I want another Joe Pesci moment. Well, you wanted to the, go like sit by the monitor and have your Pesci time, a little FaceTime with Pesci. And by the time you got back there, he was gone. <laughs> I mean, oh, let's man. start with Raging Bull, right. you know, I mean, because that was Raging Bullshit. Good night, everyone. Right. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> it, you know, just like little moments like that that were just so surreal and incredible. 
you know and um, can how about that how much fun was that how much fun was can you know look let's be honest you had fun and i didn't and and and, and <laughs> i'm just being honest i wish i did i'm not saying oh i you know i'm so professional that i don't have fun i just you know me right. i i had a lot of heavy lifting and um I, you know, at dawn was preparing right. for, you know, just getting picked up right. and I just was in every scene and, you know, people would be coming home from a night of partying and I would see <laughs> we them were jet lagged. We were a little jet lagged. as I'm, <laughs> as I'm going to set, everyone's coming in, leaving, living the dream. And by the way, and I don't mind taking a shot at him because he's a, what's the word? Cunt Malcolm McDowell, <laughs> as I'm waiting, the sun is coming up. Okay. Yeah, there's animosity. You know well, that. I, well, I, that's what I was. It's been heavily debated. Uh, there's nothing to debate. Is there animosity? But like, He's, what? But he, yeah, I, I, again, we've we've discussed this in, 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 in great detail. Why? Why would there be animosity? Well, let me finish my story, okay. and and it'll give you just a little <laughs> bit of insight. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. How You Live in J-Piv, and we'll be right back after we pay some bills. When you think of champagne, you automatically think of that classic tall flute to pour it in, right? But what you didn't know is the flute is not the best way to drink champagne. Now, most world-class sommeliers actually prefer the tulip glass. It's very close to the common white wine glass because it allows the bubbles to fully develop and release the aromas. It's mind-blowing, right? Well, I bet you never heard of Blida, which is basically an oversized shot glass used by the traditional winemakers of the Champagne region. Who knew? I didn't know. Well, just as you probably never considered a wine glass or Blida for Champagne, I bet you've also never heard of EPC Champagne. Now, EPC Champagne, this is the young French brand that is dusting off the aging image of Champagne and promoting ethics and sustainability over profits and quality over quantity. Finally, EPC is the fastest growing brand in Paris and is winning taste tests all over every competition across the globe. EPC not only offers innovative and contemporary drinking experience, it offers champagnes with complete transparency of production, something that is very rare with any champagne brand. EPC also understands the importance of health and responsible drinking, which is why all of their wines have low sugar content. It's lower than any of the other brands. And by the way, I just wanna add that the lower the sugar, the lower the hangover. They're not claiming that, but I know that personally because I do a great deal of drinking. And I, anyway, I digress. They even have an award-winning sugar-free Blanc de Blanc. That's amazing. And don't miss out on their brand new rosé from Province. A rose bottle is absolutely beautiful and makes the perfect gift for any event. EPC will be available in the U.S. for the first time ever this year. But for the U.S. Pre-launch, EPC offers to discover its wines before anyone else. Just follow EPC Champagne on Instagram and you could win their full range of champagnes and their brand new rosé. Just follow EPC Champagne and you could be the proud owner of these prestigious wines before anyone else. How cool is that? You can't lose. All you guys have to do, follow EPC Champagne on Instagram to enter. Let's get after it. You better, you, you better. I'm not going to just suddenly <laughs> be turned off by someone. Right. I, you know, everyone is innocent until proven guilty with me. Right. Everyone. Um, and I'm, we're in Cannes and I'm waiting to get picked up and the sun's coming up and I'm going like, man, I'm just have, I was having one of those moments, right. you know, we're doing a show. It's a great show. It's really, really, <laughs> what the fuck? Get out of that fuck! Away! And it just starts screaming and he's fucking, he almost runs me over with his fucking car and he's out of, Malcolm McDowell. Malcolm McDowell. Out not of the, in the episode, by the way. Not, he has nothing to do when he's screaming and he almost, he, I almost ran me over. Now, here's what he, he claims and he did my podcast and, and did That's your- what I'm saying, why would he do your podcast if he didn't? <laughs> Be, because we were doing a film together and I said I wanted to talk to him about Clockwork Orange. And, um, you know, so uh, 
like you, I know how to be very diplomatic. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But when we were filming, he would do things to me. And I, I told him all of this on my podcast. Right. And, you know, I, I was so confused by his behavior towards me. Um, and he claims he was doing that to get a performance well, out of Well, that's what me. I was, you're like, thanks, right, but no thanks, right. That Well, that was what I, I, I always had the thing of like, is this, is this him creating like the tension for the characters or, because I said he either really, he either really hates Jeremy or he like really, or he really likes him. That look, was the other. Look, I'm not a dummy. You know, I'm not a dummy. Right. I'm listening to your podcast and he goes, well, Piven, I didn't even know he was still working. And by the way, he's not a very good hang, is he? <laughs> is that what he said? That's what he said. And everyone starts laughing. No, I'm not a good hang. I'm a fucking <laughs> boring piece of shit. And apparently I don't work. But now you're on my movie. Right. And he showed up on my movie and, you know, um, and I got him on the podcast. Um, so, yeah, there's I was just a fan. Clockwork Orange is one of my favorite movies of all time. Right. He, you know, as I told him, we wanted Terrence Stamp and we ended up with um, Malcolm. And on that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But 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 by the way, every role was meant for someone else. Every, every role. Someone history, wanted every role in the history of Hollywood. They wanted they Toby were, for your right, role. You were, OK, I hate to break right, it to exactly. you. Exactly. Like if you were lucky, you were seven. You were the seventh. Choice if you're if lucky. You're lucky right. right. Yeah. Um, but. And he was he was absolutely brilliant in the role. Um, and we were already up and running. You know, I listen, it's all good. I it, wondered if it was sort of like the English kind of sticky thing, because he would say one thing, well, his words might say one thing, but his actions said another. That's how I always read it. That's why I kind of wasn't sure. I'm like, maybe these guys are best friends. Are these guys like best friends or or it just, I don't know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's it was always an odd sort of dynamic because I saw it. I'm not, I'm not even talking about the podcast stuff. I remember that stuff on the show being like, listen, okay. the, 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 not sure what that was. The reality is these two characters hated each other. Right. And, um, you know, without, without, I don't, I, I'm trying to figure out how this is going to. You're saying you don't need, you don't need his help in your performance. Would you say? I, yeah, I, well, you had been doing all right before that, right? <laughs> um, listen, we were we were all on track, doing right. our thing, right. and everyone was 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 operating. You're saying it, I don't need you to be mean to me to get my performance out of me. Like I get my own performance out of me. Basically. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's fairly presumptuous to you know to start doing method work for another actor. Right, on another actor's show. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Show, yeah. You I, know, honestly, I mean, I, like if you look, E and Ari were, were, were at odds and, and Ari thought that E was not qualified right. to, to be in Vince's life. Does that mean I see you in the morning <laughs> and go, really, bro? <laughs> right. With those fucking, you know, yeah, they yeah. have they have those shoes in fucking men's sizes, <laughs> exactly. you little fucking cunt. Sky George. Do, do you think, yeah. do you think I no, need. No, I, I, I hear you. That's what I always, I, I really, I would chalk it up. I would say maybe first I thought this is just like the British thing. This is like a weird British thing. And then I would think like, well, that was maybe a little uncalled for possibly i would say that but i don't know these guys seem to know each other maybe they I, I never i never really knew and then and then on the podcast it felt like he was kind of you know taking talk, shots taking at me shots at you and then he pops up on your podcast I'm, and then I, that's why the next podcast we were talking about maybe these guys are secretly best for, i could just never put my finger on it you know what i mean it's like because he never really it's almost like if you guys were really good friends, some of those things you'd be like, oh, that's just kind of their relationship, sort of, right? Like him saying that you're not a fun hang. You guys could have a relationship where that was a joke, is was my thought, you know? But I never... Listen, the, the reality is this. Um, as you know, if you were to judge who I am based on how I was on set... Holy fuck, I'm boring. Right. And the reality is, as you know, right. as I was, 
a thousand percent of the time trying to hold it together right. and trying to just stay in the zone and do the best work I can. Not for any other reason than I just, you know, I grew up in the theater and you right. and you, you respect the space you occupy when you work. Right. That's it. Right. That's it. So I wasn't very fun on set. Um, you know what I mean? And yeah, but I, well, I mean, I, we, we know we, we have friends in comics. I, I didn't, I never thought of you as like, I wouldn't have said that you're not a fun guy. I wouldn't have never, I didn't have that right. vibe. But, uh, but the, you know, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher one of Denzel's quotes, but it's like, he said something like, I, I, I would rather people on set not know me and mis uh, I'd rather be misunderstood than to be everyone's best friend and feel like I compromise my performance. Right. Right. Do you know what I mean? I hear you. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and, and also the other thing too, is as you get a little bit older, like use Denzel as an example, you know, I was in John Q and you know, I was excited to be working with Denzel. I was nervous. I was all those things. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was pretty early on in the shoot and, you know, at a certain point, like in hindsight, I realized I, I really just wanted to, to talk to Denzel about acting. And I like created this like, like character issue or something that was not really his place to help me through, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Because he's, his kid's dying. He's got, he's killing, he's doing this, all this stuff going on. Right. And, and he, he's kind of, he stopped himself, but I could tell he wanted to say like, and then he was like, go ahead. And he stopped himself. He said, what, 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 what is it that you want to ask? But he basically wanted to say like, like he's doing his thing and, and it's all on him. It's riding on him. He's the one getting paid the big bucks. That movie bombed. They weren't going to say, oh, Connolly really dropped the ball. That one, they're going to, it's on Denzel. So there's a different responsibility. So when you see an actor, I've always said it. When I see an actor locked into, into his zone and it's like, hey man, I oh, don't need to be best, best friends. This, this guy's locked in or this girl's locked in doing their thing. As long as everybody's delivering, like, so be it, right? Like, we'll catch up for a drink down the road, you know? So I I, I do believe that. But it's, again, that's something that kind of came with age, right? You know, also, too, like, Denzel not saying that he was doing the method thing, but he's holding us hostage, right? So, yeah, would he walk around and be like, hey, so what would you do this weekend, Kev? No, he's there to work, you know? And that's really, at the end of the day, People are there to work. And when you're performing on that level, you just got to let it happen, man. And it's, the, you know, to someone who doesn't, who hasn't experienced this, it sounds like we're being really pretentious right now. But it's like, you know, you just, there's a certain responsibility to doing the best you possibly can. That's it. And so I just kind of respect anyone's process. You know, Kevin Dillon, what does he do? Hoo-ha. No, that's Ayuga. that. <laughs> what does he do? Ayuga. Ayuga. Um, You know, it's funny. I wanted to mention who, yeah. who talked about it on the podcast. Uh, we had Jordan Belfi on, Adam Davies, right? Yes. And he talked about the slap. Yes. And, you know, it, it, it more so. He was so, very offended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as, as it turns out. He yeah. Was, he was very offended. But after he left, right? Well, he told his story. And after we left, we just had sort of an internal thing. And it's it's an interesting thing because there is the train the school of thought of like, you know, hey man, like people will be watching this for a long time. Like, let's go, right? Like, okay, I'm ready, you know, let's 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 do it, right? So what what was your thought on Jordan, a guy like that being offended by a slap that happens in a scene or 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 approaching something like that in a scene. Yeah, I mean, you know, they say never use another actor, never really strike someone. But I remember um, my intention with him in that moment was, um, I, I want to get a great reaction out of him that he's going to be proud of. Right. That is going to shock. That's going to have. That's going to shock him. And he's a big, strong kid. And yeah, I, I don't remember that. But I have to look at him like, yeah, he's a big, guy. he's a big guy. It's like, I think he was like a college athlete. Yeah, he's, he's a, big, a he's a big, yeah. big strong kid. So kind of, I kind of made contact with him, and it was a great take, and we used it. But the reality is, yeah, I was technically wrong, right? Because you the law, the the whatever the acting rules, you don't use another actor. Yeah, you never use another actor. Right. Now, to a fault, I'm the kind of person that. If you're not getting it on the day, you do everything in your power to get it. Right. 
You know what I mean? And that's why I just got injured. Right. I just fucking put my body in jeopardy. Right. To the point where I broke my ribs to get a shot. And it's and I went too far. Right. And uh and it's a lesson and you learned oh, your lesson yeah. as well. The lesson the hard way. Yeah. yeah, man. And it's all part of it. Um never use another actor. Never that's one of the things that you've done uh for me uh over the years as well. Like there's like the kind of the hand uh like we were talking about improv, like, oh you never respond with a with a question right are you a t you right. always have these because you know you grew right. up with in an, you know in an acting class family where you would kind yeah. of lay out some of the kind of the rules i never heard that one before i mean it makes sense you use another actor or certainly not without their permission would be the would be the word there right absolutely um and you know that was one of those moments where like yeah i I felt he had he hadn't gotten it yet, right? And I I wanted for his sake and our sake right. to have that moment. And you know, looking back, I was, you know, it, it was wrong what I did, and the result was great. Right. So it's this weird kind of duality of of what's the I right. I think thing I asked him that too. I was I think I asked him. I was like, well, did did it? You know, I mean, I I, I think well, yeah, got, got the reaction right. Not say that it's right or wrong or whatever. You yeah, know? I mean. But the reaction was there. And what did he say? Yeah, he, uh, you know, uh, I think he clearly is proud of it, right? Of the moment or of the of the scene. And I think it was a good, I think it was just overall was a great scene for him. So I think, I think, I don't know if, I don't know if I, I don't know if I pulled that out of him or he offered that up. I'd have to go back and listen. But it started with like, hey, this is my big, a big scene for him, right? So He's clearly proud of it, right? He's talk, still talking about it. Um, so he liked it. So maybe it worked. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if I if we pulled out the slap thing. I don't know. I'm not sure how that how that played out. Yeah, it's um, we're we're we're, we're trying to create these right. improvisational right. feeling moments, and that's why you know. And I I think it would it would kind of bother Doug a little bit because he works so hard on the script. Right. And, you know, um, it's our job to make it all look improvisational. So right. people thought it was improvised right. when the reality was, it was all written right. by Doug Ellen who worked his ass off. And um, that's part of the reason why I was always locked into this gear because it was word for word. Right. We had to be word for word. And um, so we had to really be in the zone. You know, and so Doug was a little angry as, as as he should have been that like, no, it wasn't improvised. You know, right. this was he, right. he fucking killed himself to get it word right. for word. But that's it's all part of it. I remember one of the fun, fun stories I talked about the Sundance episode when we were walking down and you hit me in the face with the snowball. And I was like, Jeremy. You gotta pack the snowball at the last second because remember we had like a oh, we had like a shit. two minute walk and talk. Jeremy's making snowball on action. By the time by the time we get there, oh my god, ice ice zip my head. I'm like, dude, you gotta hit me with a so, slushy snowball and not the not the ice ball coming down the middle of the plate. It, you know, it was funny, but um, but yeah, the at the end there I am. I get hit with a get hit with the snowball. So I I, I get it about not using the other actor thing but i i think there's a case to be made on, on on either side of it maybe they maybe they're in the know i guess right i mean like but then it would have been a surprise you know i i was just uh my sister was directing me in this movie that i've been putting together for a decade and um so we're in post-production now and um there's a moment with another actor where it's just really, really just a heavy, heavy, heavy scene. And um, uh, I just went to a certain place emotionally and he got so frustrated with me in the scene because I was supposed to say some things that were very uncomfortable to him and I was having a real hard time getting it out. I wasn't premeditated going, I'm going to take this huge pause. I literally was just welling up because it was very difficult. And I was just present for the scene and I was there. And he got so frustrated as the character, he lost his shit on me. And it was, and he scared the shit out of me. You know what I mean? And I was so thankful right. for that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. Yes. Yes. So I think this all kind of goes under that you know but but yeah it does go back to you can't 
use the other actor and um you know had i broken your face with one of those ice balls it would have been very unfortunate <laughs> well, that was different because well that, well that's the other thing too that's in the script right so is that i mean that's not using the other actor that's in the script right yeah don't go anywhere how you live in j piv and we'll be right back after we pay some bills so you know what's really interesting um I smoke cigars all the time and, and everyone, if they're in a picture or whatever, someone says, hey man, where'd you get those? And, uh, you know, I tell them and you know what my favorite cigars are. And then I just thought, you know what? I, cause I'm very particular about my cigars. What is the best way to find a cigar that is really right for me, that I love, that has everything that I want? I really, I, I, wanna, I want an easy draw. There's some cigars, and I won't name any names, Cohiba, um, that are rolled. They're the best in the world, but they're rolled really tightly, and it's it's hard to pull off them. And so I want like a really easy draw. I want that rich, layered flavor. Listen, I went to the, the good people at Illusione. Dion over there is the man. He's a master blender, and... Um, he worked with me and he's patient and I'm a little bitch. I kept saying, listen, man, I want, you know what I mean? A little more of the coffee flavor. You know what I'm saying? Can we get some layers here and easier draw, whatever? And here we are, the J Piv Robusto. I, I, I've got, I never thought it would happen. I'm living the dream. Listen, luxurycigarclub.com is where you can order them. Uh, Illusioni makes them. They make them for me. It was a collaboration. I'm going to smoke one right now. If you guys send your review of the JPIV Robusto, I will send you a free stick and we shall raise one up together. I, I It's the least I can do. You guys send me a review and let me know what you guys think. I really want to know. And the great thing about the internet is they're brutal. So I'm going to get it. You know, hey, be careful what you wish for. I look forward to it. I, I believe in these. J. Piver Busto. Thanks, you guys. Did you guys know that EPC Champagne is rated in the top 1% of wines in the world on Vivino, the Vivino app, okay? Comparatively, let me give you a little perspective. The rest of the French Champagnes with similar ratings are listed for hundreds of dollars compared to EPC, which costs merely a fraction of that amount. You can do the math on that. Great Champagne, for a fraction of the cost, count me in. Here's something else I think is really cool. EPC offers customized bottle etchings so you can put on your own logo. I'm gonna put a little JPIV on there or how you live in JPIV. I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna start drinking. That's another problem that we don't have enough time for right now. Here's the deal. <laughs> Just imagine how cool you could feel popping your own personalized bottle this summer at the pool, your beach party with your friends, your birthday party, whatever. Giving that special little someone the perfect gift on the perfect day, just a little day drinking, I'll see you there. EPC will be available in the U.S. for the first time ever, you guys. But the U.S. pre-launch, EPC offers you to discover its wines before anyone else. Just follow EPC Champagne on Instagram and you could win their full range of champagnes and their brand new rosé. Just follow EPC Champagne and you could be the proud owner of these prestigious wines before anyone else. How cool is that? You can't lose. All you guys have to do, follow EPC Champagne on Instagram to enter. Let's get after it. You better, you, you better. I think about Can. I think about Sundance and I'm not talking about fun that we had outside. I'm just thinking about like what a unique experience it was to be able to, to do all those things. And the U2, how much fun was the U2 concert? Us out there trying to get up to the, remember we had like floor general admission seats. We we're trying to like get through some old ladies to get to the stage. They were like, Oh no, I remember that. I remember. I, I was, cause I'm such a U2 fan. I was at the concert the night before just watching the show. Right. And I told Doug, and Doug said, ask Bono if he could say happy birthday, Johnny Drama, on the mic. And I was like, I don't know Bono. Right. He goes, no, just, just ask him. Okay. So I literally go backstage, and I'm just stalking Bono like a f fucking creeper. I'm just following him, and, and I'm just watching him, and he's my hero. And, you know, he's such a gentleman. Going, They were kind of escorting him around and meeting everyone. He's a rock star, Bono. Right? It's like, just incredible. It's so I finally go up to him and uh, I ask him, you know, if, if you know, we're here, we're, we're doing a show. I'm not sure you've ever heard of it. You know, we were just beginning. It's called Entourage and we have a character, Johnny Drama, and he's a huge fan. He's, you know, like, you know, first, second generation Irish, you know, and um, 
you know, it's his birthday. Would you say, would you, would you possibly say happy birthday, Johnny Drum on the mic? And he just puts his hands and, together and he's like, oh, I'll try. I'll certainly try. You know, and it was just so, so sweet. And I went up to Paul McGinnis, his manager and his assistant. And I tried everyone around and McGinnis said, yeah, you guys are, you guys are the underdogs like we were, you know, no one really knows about you yet. And I appreciate you guys. And we're going to do everything we can. And they did. They had no reason I, I, to. I've, I've they, never, they didn't know about that's us. That's the most cynical I've ever been walking into. I'm like, wait a second. So, so Bono, 18,000, 20,000 people sold out. And he's going to say happy birthday, Johnny Drama. He's going to forget. It is never going to happen. And we shouldn't take it personally. We'll figure something out. But yeah. Bono has got a lot going on. He's got the earpiece in the song set. Yeah. He's not saying it's happy birthday, Johnny Drama. When those words came out of his mouth, I just couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. It's I couldn't believe it. It's fucking crazy. It was wild. And unbeknownst to me, that was my first experience kind of producing anything. You know, right. I kind of felt like a little bit what it was like to kind of go behind the scenes. And you've been doing that for get a really- Get something done, right? Like uh, you bring something to the table. Right. That was a big one. That was a big get. Yeah. And no one really knew. And and so that's another case where it's just like, just shut up and do it. Right. You know, and if you're looking for someone to pat you on the back for doing something- It's that's never going to happen. Never. Right. right. Never going to happen. No. So when, out of curiosity, when did you know, because we, we had no idea, you know, how this, you know, if anyone's going to watch our show, what was the moment for you where you went, oh, okay. Yeah. People are watching. This is something different. You know, it's funny. We, I, I feel like I have a, di I feel like my experience was different than everybody else. To me, it felt instant. Really? Yeah. I mean, like, Sunday, the show aired, and then Monday, things felt different for me in LA. Anyway, it just did. I can't, couldn't explain it, couldn't really explain it. Just very soon after the first time it aired, I don't know, I just could feel eyes. And then, you know, and I don't know, it, 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 it happened quick for me where I think, I feel like I'm the only, other people feel like it was a bit of a, a little bit of a longer burn. Maybe you, because Dylan and I were so out of, we're, we weren't in the belly right, of the beast. Right. You're in Hollywood. Right, right. So right, I was you La could track I it. La Siena and Sunset. Right. Like walking into <laughs> Starbucks. And right. And that, not anymore, but back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want to slum it. Starbucks. Um, yeah. it, felt, it felt really fast to me. I don't know. Um, but it's weird too. I mean, have you noticed a, like a, a, a COVID surge with uh, Entourage? It feels like, Oh, people come up to me and be like, I watched it and I'm thinking, well, you were six when the, the show, I, I feel like, I don't know if it was the, the quarantine, but it does feel to be a second wave of people that, you know, seems to be holding up. It, 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 thank you. It, it, it absolutely does. Um, Brooklyn Beckham. David Beckham's son. He was five when that when the show went off the air. Just reach out to me. He's like, man, I just finished it. I'm like, right. am I in a time warp? What, what planet am I? What the fuck right. is going on? And it's just kind of amazing because I, you know, I'm, now I'm at the point now where people like that, I'm like, I'm friends with your dad. Right. You know? Right, right. Yeah, so right. I'd be, your dad you know, and I go way back, right? Yeah. Um, you know. Can you imagine if Entourage ever hit Netflix? I mean, it couldn't, obviously, because, you know, HBO Max, but... It would be, you know, I, I, I think, I, I just think if we were on Netflix, I just think, I think it would o open up a whole, I think it would take it to a whole nother level. I don't know if that, with what the likelihood of that is, would even be possible, but I feel like well, Entourage on Netflix would be huge. Do you think, um, you know, the, the, the show existed um, in much different times? Right. And, um, you know, now we're living in times uh, where, you know, you have to be incredibly mindful for uh, about people's feelings. Right. And you can be held hostage because of people's feelings. Right. Um, and with characters like Ari Gold, that was an equal opportunity offender. You know, do you think that, that it could exist today? I think it would exist the way that it would have to exist, right? It, if... Ari Emanuel or whatever you want to call it would be in trouble in 30 seconds if they talked that way. So they would have to figure out a way not to do it. Right. Right. And, so, and th th you, that it in it's different because it's different. You're a director that in itself makes for interesting 
I agree. I agree. Anytime that someone has to navigate, and and also if you have an audience that knows who that person is, and they're like, "My God, oh, at any moment he's going to lose it." So like that's drama and comedy, and it's all the stakes are incredibly high. I think that, him, that's what I've always felt about the reboot. It's almost like the reboot almost would make more sense now than it would have because it'd be like, "How are they going? How how is this going to go?" Right, it would beg the question, how how does Ari Gold exist in this world? It exists the way that any larger than life agent or whatever exists, they have to train themselves to act differently or keep it and, and closed also, quarters or whatever. Also the, you know? the active, watching a character like that actively learn about how to navigate this space. That's my point. It's more it, interesting. It is kind of it's fascinating. Like, hey, where are these guys now? Oh, you're not going to believe this. Ari just bought his own planet. That's not as interesting as how is, how is he navigating these waters? How is right. Johnny Drama navigating these waters? Um, and by the way, I, I think that is a, a really great fertile premise to learn about sensitivity and right. what's going on. Right. And 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 how we can all understand each other, um, you know. I've been lucky enough to to be on the road doing comedy where, you know, people really embrace their freedom of speech. Right. And um, guys like Chappelle are fearless, um, and speaking about it. Um, and it's interesting because I I I feel like, look, the reality is, you know, you talked about the authenticity of podcasts and how it's supply and demand you're either reaching people or you're not dave Chappelle show sells out everywhere right and he you know he's the number one guy on netflix right now and people he's a genius he's he, bigger he, than squid games indeed he's bigger than squid indeed games. so um people want to see that and right. it, it it is um offensive to some and uh, he's speaking the truth as he knows it right. through his experience. And, and comedians get, uh, I don't want to get in trouble over there. Comedians get a little more leeway, right? I mean, not not leeway, but that's what they do, right? Isn't that different than, right? I mean, it's, I don't know, Richard Pryor, the list goes on and on. I mean, you know, you listen to Eddie Murphy, he'll tell you that hey, when he watches Raw, he like cringes at some of the things he's saying, but it's comedian's job to push the envelope. No, I mean- their stand up or certainly not to I mean Chappelle said to me one time that if you're not going to be funny at least be interesting right and um he's always been both right and it's rare um and they say speak your truth up there and that's one of the reasons why I've loved it because I just get up there and um and and get to navigate that space right and um I have nothing to hide and it's a very comfortable place for me. And and I, I is would- Is it comfortable being up there, stand up? I mean, does it, it take- It is. The first it, few it, little rough coming out of the gate? I mean, oh, I very, very, very rough coming out of the gate. Are you kidding? It's not like doing a play where it's like, I know my lines. I rehearsed the shit out of this. I can do it, right? It's navigating the crowd and- uh, I'll never forget the first time I got up and did stand up. Well, uh, I was doing- Having it. a heart attack thinking about it. Well, thinking about I mean, this will be very specific and you'll start to get chest pains when I start talking about it. Um, I was doing a charity event because I have a huge heart. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the biggest heart in Hollywood. Um, and it was, you know, raising money for kids. And, to, you know, buy, we bought them a bunch of toys and it was fucking awesome. And and Laugh Factory has always been great about that. And um, the great Russell Peters was hosting and he's internationally known and one of the killers of stand-up. And, you know, he had me up there co-hosting with him i'll never forget it i got up on stage and i've been on stage since i was eight years old so it's a very comfortable place for me but the stage at the laugh factory is tiny right. it's a tiny little stage and i got up there it's a little circle little right. yeah it's a, like a little half moon and um i just remember feeling so completely pinned in and i will i was frozen but Stop what I'm using words like pinned and frozen. Yeah, bro. I'm dying over no, you here, have bro. no idea. And right. like, you know, Starting everyone go and, 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 and everyone's staring at you. And yet what's so fascinating about the human psyche is like, I've spent more time on stage than in life. Like right. that's my right. home, but it's a different version of, 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 of that exchange. Yes, it is. And so what I did was, um, because I'd never done stand up and this was like, come on up. And this is before I decided to do it. 
and they were like, you'll just improvise with Russell and you'll work, work the crowd. I did my homework. And the reality is working a crowd is probably one of the most difficult part of stand up right. because you have to engage with someone, be very patient, right. uh, treat them like, you know, like, you know, they're friends and allies and whatever, no matter what's coming at you, no matter what heckles coming at you, you're very, you almost want to be their therapist until something unfolds. That's funny. And then you jump on it. Right. That takes uh skill. And also you have to log the hours for that. And right. I'm coming up on stage. You just work the crowd. You right. Just decide to work the crowd. You have to learn like anything else how to work the crowd. Yes. You, you have to put your time in and I had no time in. So what I did was I cheated and I worked on some material and because I knew, even though I've been improvising my whole life, I was like, this is going to be incredibly difficult. He's like the Michael Jordan of crowd work. Russell he can work the crowd. Yes. He does entire specials where he works the crowd. So I knew I was set up to fail. Right. So I, I had some jokes in my pocket and I threw them out there and they worked and I immediately got hooked. Right. I immediately was like, this is incredible. It's like hitting a good golf shot. Yeah. You go like, my God, I'm in. Right. Yeah. And then your next joke bombs and you're like, oh, wait, I'm out. And that's the, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the other thing. It's inevitable, right? It doesn't matter. Of inevitably, something going to be in the air, whether it's the crowd and the jokes don't fly. And inevitably, no matter who you are, you're going to walk off stage one night and go, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? Right. But what's so great about that is, is because I'm such a, a fan of the game. Every person that I, that opens for me, I just, talk to them as much as you know until they're sick of me right. you know and i just ask them a million questions and i just am a student of the game right. um and so you just learn okay you're bombing you know um how are you going to work your your way out and i learned very quickly that because i was bombing so badly at the dime you know the dime hey, you course. know i've been at the dime with you yes, we've been. at a million o'clock <laughs> It's the dirtiest, grimiest. You but they do a stand-up thing there, huh? Bro, it is the toughest room. Chappelle said to me, oh, man, that's a tough room. <laughs> and I'm like, it's a tough room for him? Right. Think about it. Um, it's it's a tiny little bar where you get up on a little milk crate, you know, and there's a pin spot that hits you and nothing works. And there's three people that are there to see the DJ right. and all the comics are lined up in the back. Oh, it is the toughest room I've ever experienced in my life. The dime. The dime. On Fairfax. And Andy's <laughs> Andy's behind, you know, the bar with right. his arms folded, you know, because he wants to get up there. Right. And you better kill it. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it it's fascinating. And, and I kind of was very lucky in the way that I learned in a, an incredibly tough room. And I remember being up there thinking, not only am I not funny right now, but maybe I've never been funny ever in my life i started everything. doubting not just right. that set but everything i've ever said and i just was slowly crawling back into the womb right. and doubting myself and it was, it was but if you can somehow breathe and not run off because all you want to do is run off right that's all you want to do is get out of there stop the fucking pain right but if you can somehow dig your way out and then start being self-deprecating and admit what's going on you'll get them right and if you can do that you're gonna get it better faster and fast right. because you've worked through that because if you run off you got to start all over again right but then the next time you get up you're like oh i've already bombed worse than this i got this so you just keep building and building but you have to be willing to eat shit yeah and and like you said it's not it's fun like, well you you got to take the you got to learn what that first punch is gonna gonna feel like right and it's like all right well, yeah, that was a pretty good right hand to the jaw i'm, I'm alive and now you know what the punch feels like. I right. just got to try to avoid it. Right. But I think the initial fear for most people is like, what's that going to feel like? What's going to happen? At what point do you walk off? You know? At what uh, point the heckler? I hate I hate hecklers. It just feels, feels counter. I, for, for example, if I go to a comedy show or a comedy club, I'm going because I want to go out laugh. Right. Have some fun, some mm -hmm. drinks. I don't want. I'm not going to to not laugh. I'm not like looking to not like a comedian. I'm here to like you. Right. You know. I never understood. It's like, oh, Yo, you don't get out of here. Go go to a regular bar. What are you doing in a comedy club if you're not there to laugh? Right. So. Right. Do do you feel like most people are there to laugh for the most part? One thousand percent. Right. And 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 by the way, whenever I bring up the podcast or whatever, there are people that that and, and I get to see in real time that they're with us and it's incredible. Um, I love the opportunity to get into it with an audience, 
But my heckles are so weird, they're even more difficult right. because I have people yelling out lines right. from Entourage, Entourage, for instance. Season three. You know what I mean? Six. And so how do you kind of engage? And right. I'm sorry, sir, do you have Tourette's? Are you okay? Right. You just keep yelling Lloyd and you're <laughs> fucking twitching. Like, what's going on right now? You know what I mean? So it's 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 interesting like how that all works but every single time it's different you know and it's it's fascinating and and i i love it and you guys are getting a sense of it doing live shows yeah um the interesting thing about a live show though is that it's still a podcast right so at the end of the day it's it's not stand up it's a podcast right it's different like we did a show at the paramount there's a thousand people there i love that for a podcast it's a podcast it's not that, i'm like hey is anybody playing an instrument dylan do you still know how to play the drums from the doors what are we doing up right. there we're sitting out there talking right you now so that's a great theater oh the paramount theater is amazing it's amazing absolutely amazing um so you it was fun it was fun but it was all those things and and also i'm from long island so there was a little bit of the hometown nerves i mean you know my my gym teacher my middle school gym teacher was there right like you got all these people out there right so um that one had was a little little unnerving just because it was so close to home. There's so many people that I knew there. Right. Um, but yeah, I would I, I would do it. I don't I don't know that Dylan's a huge fan of the live of the of the live show. You know, he's a little more structured. Doug, you know, Doug loves it. Doug Doug is like a man on with the microphone. I mean, he's just dude. He's the he's our he's our point guard. I mean, he's, he's the point guard. He started as a stand up. Yep. So he's he's living his dream right now. Yeah. It's 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 pretty fun. Um. But I think it's different, right? Like the room at the Paramount is amazing. It's just a beautiful venue. But at the end of the day, we go and we sit down in chairs like this. And really, how are we supposed to entertain a thousand people sitting there talking, you know? And then you don't know. And the other thing too with the podcast is like, are we are we talking about the podcast? Are we, are we doing like entourage stuff? It was, it's really hard to, it's hard to know. Crowds felt pretty young too, which was interesting. Wasn't that, like it was younger. That's than, amazing. Than I thought, which was also good because they were with us every step along the way, and it was just like they just felt like they were one of the guys. You know? How often does it come up with with you guys, and when you know when you're asking you know questions from the audience and stuff like that? How often does the question about the reboot come up? Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's it's never never ending about the about the reboot, and I, and I've always said this, and my answer about the reboot has never changed. I don't like yeah. Let's do it. But I, I don't sit there and like, all right, well, who could I call at HBO? Like, I don't, if it, it happens, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'll, it'll be, I'll be pleasantly, su pleasantly surprised if the, if the, if the phone rings. I just, I don't, I try not to think too much about it until there's something to think about. Well, you look exactly the same, uh, exactly the, the, the same. <laughs> You look sane and exactly the same. I look like a wandering Jewish hobo, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, but mostly because I'm 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 healing up at the moment. But yeah, I mean, listen, the reality is everywhere you look, they're rebooting something, which is crazy. Well, they're rebooting crazy. shows that people never even heard of. Like, I mean, they're rebooting eight is enough or something crazy like that. There was people they're rebooting shows that people never heard of the, uh, the first time around you know so again it did it, it and i'm not speaking about uh, entourage because i actually think that would make more sense than i'm not just saying that i believe that yeah but some of these other shows it's like just call it something else right <laughs> just give it a new name Right. Does it have to be Silver Spoons the reboot well apparently it does i mean I guess, there, there's right? there's something in that they know more than me so well, but this, would you do it? Listen, man, you know, just even doing, you know, mixing up with you guys at Victory was just so fun. Right. You know what right. I mean? Um, and I, I do really believe that there, it could be fascinating to, to watch all of us and especially Ari Gold try to navigate this climate. Yeah. You know, and that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's it's more interesting than well, what's he up to now? What 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 has he conquered? What mountain has he climbed? This is a more interesting mountain to watch. I mean, Lloyd would have to break down so much for him. Right. How you know how to navigate and and you know uh, uh, you know 
it just there's so much humor. It's, could you imagine the two of them? Because he could offend Lloyd because right. he's been on Lloyd's side the whole time and, and was giving him a lot of tough love right. so that he could be an agent. So he could say these things to him in private. But then, you know, he, no, that's not offensive. Yes, it is. Ari. Let me tell you why. You know, right. Maybe we all could learn from that. I remember at one point Ari saying, I've always been, a, a you know, an, an ally to the to the gay man. And Lloyd's like, no, you haven't, Ari. He's, <laughs> you are not a friend to the gay man. You know what I mean? Right. Like, um, there's there's so much there. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I, but. But you're the same way. It's not like you're just like sitting there like, hey, is today the day? Like, hey, it'll be a great call. It'll be a pleasant call to get. I don't think too much about it. If that, And I don't mean that in a way that. Uh, but it's kind that. of amazing you don't think about it when the reality is. It's like one of the reasons people tune in because like you even just said, you're more E than you've ever been. You're <laughs> right. you're the suit in the room now. Right. Yeah. Cracking the whip. Right. And you're wrangling Johnny, I mean, Kevin Dillon. Yeah. See what I did there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. See, what see what I did? Yeah, see. You know what I mean? So people are tuning in because, you know, they it miss you guys. It feels like those di interesting, similar dynamics, right? And it, it, it is that. It's like, Ke where is Kevin? Like, nobody knows. He's a golf tournament. <laughs> Kevin's playing golf. I'm like, well, isn't he? I mean, it's Eli Manning. Is he, 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 what do you want me to do for charity, bro? Tell Eli, what do you want me to do? Is he want me to quit on a charity event? I'm like, well, I guess not, you know? So um, Kevin definitely, it's it's definitely more of a, of a of a hobby for him. Like, you know, he he would split from the podcast for like the right the right acting gig. I mean, it's it's easy, you know, it, it's fun. But for him, it's a drive. It's an hour, hour and a half drive or wherever he's coming from. So... Um, we try to knock out a couple uh, in a day, so we got a couple good. You know, we're getting coming on Juliana Pena, who's who's. Did you see that fight? Yeah, I mean, unreal. So we got Oakley and Juliana Pena. So we got a couple a uh, couple athletes coming up in the next. In the next see, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. So like, um, ignorance is bliss, right? Like, I literally reached out to Michael Jordan's people, right? And I was like, "Is there any way they're like, um, Jeremy?" Let me, we love you. Right. Michael loves you. He doesn't do press for his own projects. Right. He will not be doing your podcast. Right. You know? But I'm that dumb. I'm like, hey, would Michael do my, right. you know what I mean? Right. Like, no. Well, I said, we joke around. Like, Dylan's like, yeah, notice, uh, you know, Leo never popped up in an episode of Entourage. I said, yeah, neither did Matt Dillon, right? Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> what are we talking about? It's your brother. Matt Dillon never, you know, was on the show, you know? So it's funny. It's, 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 hard thing to do because not some people just don't do it right i mean i think you go into a, a friendly place i think you want to know that it's you know sometimes you could walk into a podcast i mean i'm sure you've ever done a podcast with somebody and been kind of ambushed right i mean like yeah so i'm saying i mean people you know at a certain point like you have to have respect for your for your guest right they're doing they're they're doing you a favor but there's other people it's like hey this could be a good opportunity to go viral God, I, hate, I hate to saying these ridiculous words they think like going viral like there are people that will do that it will tee you up will line you up for it you know so that's the other part of it right so it's like really like what what benefit is it of michael jordan to do anybody's podcast right well you know being someone that grew up in chicago right. and every time i've seen him he's been so insanely gracious with me right the fact that he even remembers me is just insane to me right and he's just always so insanely cool, you know, and puts his you arm around me. Maybe, it. right. Zoom could have happened. Well, what is it? The answer The answer to the unasked look, question. The, the reality is. There was is, no anyway, right? So, no, so. look, the, re the reality is, is he knows and they know that I would never throw that guy under the bus. And right. I, I've, I've had moments with him. Like I remember being on a boat with him and, and Spike Lee and Ahmad Rashad. And all of us are just grilling Michael just asking him one story after the next, you know what I mean? And he just sat back and had a Corona, not the virus, the beer, and um, and just and just told us everything that we wanted to hear. And it was absolutely fascinating. And he's a mensch, he's a really right. sweet guy. And he knows that if he- He were, knows you wouldn't do that. Of me. course. But generally speaking, I get calls from people like, hey, come do the podcast, and you just don't know. It's like, I don't know you. Right, like, yeah, I could zoom into your podcast, and God only knows what you could do. Imagine we're in Chicago, the Bulls are going for championship number six. You know, um, it's 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 
I'm doing Chicago theater. I'm lucky enough to go and watch the games. I mean, it's, you know, the greatest time for me in sports history. For me, for not for you. We are Chicago right. fans, exactly. but you have to admit you love oh, those yeah. guys. Come on, man. Well, and also when it's a, when guys like that, you start winning like that, you're like, at this point, just keep it going, right? That's almost how I feel about Brady at this point. Like, all right, let's run it back. Yeah, might as well go for it, you know. So yeah, exactly. I, no, it's a great time in sports. I mean, it was, you know. I mean, just the idea that you could, you know, go and watch those guys live is just insane, and um, you know, we. I, you know, we all know guys on the Blackhawks and, you know, Chelly and everyone, and we're all kind of, you know, friends and whatnot. And, you know, they're kept, you know, every time because, you know, you're, you're it's a small circle, right? It, 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 big city, but that world, you, Chelios, all those guys, it's like kind of a smaller circle within the big, within the big city. Right. And, you know, yeah, very much so. And, you know, because, you know, you're working and actors have strange hours. So I, every time I went out, I can't tell you how many times I heard, oh, you just missed MJ. I heard that all the time. I did where, And it was just like, it, it was just so surreal. I kept missing him every time. So um, my father gets this, my, I grew up in an acting family, the Piven Theater. My father gets a call from, from Larsa Pippen, Scotty's wife, then wife. Uh, Sc uh, Larsa would like to meet about acting classes. My father and I, God bless Larsa, but we don't know Larsa. Right. We immediately just start, you know, just salivating for the at the idea of meeting Scotty Pippen. Right. Right. So could you possibly bring Scotty? No problem. So smash cuts. Of, uh, we're sitting with Scotty Pippen. 98. 97. 97. 97 right? You know, and um, we're talking to Larsa about acting classes. And Scotty looks at my father and goes, um... What, what what kind of roles do you see me playing? And um, <laughs> my father, here's the problem with my father. If you think I'm embarrassing, right. my father did not have this chip where he spoke his truth, no matter what the circumstance was. He didn't know how to monitor himself. You know, he just always was that guy. And um, I loved it and appreciated it, but others didn't know what to do with him. And so he looked at Scotty and he said, you know, I see you as someone from the country. And he goes, you call me country? And it just started getting very awkward. You know what I'm I mean? I'm not saying that you're saying that you. <laughs> I see you as someone like a fish out of water. You come to the city and you don't know how to navigate. And then Scott is like, how long do you think it'll take me to become famous? And I thought I was like, I can't, I can't answer that question. But, and it just, it, it just started heading down this road where it was just like, there is no way this was was ultimately going to happen. Did your dad talk Scotty Pippen out of pursuing an acting career? Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. That's what it sounds like, right? Yeah. Scotty was like, oh, you know what? Maybe uh, try to roll. Maybe I'll go to Houston. Scotty, yeah, wrap this up and go. By, to Houston. by the way, Scotty would be Idris Elba if it wasn't for my father. Right, he talked right, him out okay, of it. Right, right. No. So he would have gotten the role in Training Day. Clearly, up, neither one of them ended up studying, and you know. It, it, it's all part of it and right. and i've seen him here and there and he's always really really sweet and he would be actually a, a a brilliant person because for whatever reason he's um being very open about his time with the bulls right yes he is you know what i've found too and it's it was really hard for me to get used to but now i just realize i don't really give a shit i just i just dm people you know be like hey <laughs> i dm'd antonio brown so you come on the Vip, come on the victory podcast. You know what he said? You got a bag, fam? <laughs> said, uh, well, how big a bag are we talking about? And then I like started asking around. I was like knowing what he was like asking for. I said, A B, best of luck. I got no bag, bro. Not a bag that you're gonna be interested in. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, fire up. I guess my point is. You fire off a DM to Scotty Pippen and I'll bet you you get a response in 24 hours. And he'll probably do it. Yeah, I mean. He's got to now be worried about like, oh God, because I've a couple times where I'm like, God, I can't believe that that person like just blatantly just read it and ignored it. You know, once you get past that, once it happens a couple times. You know, you know what's, what's interesting to me is like, if you do a deep dive into someone like Michael Jordan, 
he'll do an interview, for instance, with Cigar Aficionado, um, where it's fascinating. Right. And it it only does him justice. It's like it, it doesn't. It's a great service to him because we all want to know what his mindset is. Right. You know what I mean? Because still, he's the elite of the elite. You know, and even Kobe, whether he would admit it or not, was chasing that. Of course. You know, and and LeBron would never admit it, but he wants six rings. He, you know, he'd be, you know, if and it, if you to think that Brady didn't take note of that number seven. Yeah. Would be, of course, that's the first thing he's thinking about. Oh, Michael's got six. I got six. Now I got seven. You know, that's the, for sure. Like he sets the bar, you know. Now, granted, there's variables. He won six to two years off. They would have won eight. They would have won eight. They would have won, he would have, they would have won eight titles in a row had he not laid off those two years, which is insane. Possibly. Probably. Yeah, man. So, you know, what's the worst? Now, ironically, um, you know, he he donated all the money he made from the last dance to charity. You know, I don't um and that is I arguably one of the most watched um documentaries of all time. And we needed it. Yeah. When it was happening. Yeah. Like it came at a, it came at the right time. Like remember it was just like the height of the lockdown and there was like something comforting about the last dance. Yeah. This is like reminded you of like that's so ridiculous. Simpler times. But yeah, it was like there was something it was comfort food, the last dance. C- completely. Yeah. But just imagine all the elements. First of all, they had unlimited access at a time to, you know, rarefied air. No no pun intended, right. to a team going for um history. And then the only way that Michael did it was to say, okay, I'll do it, but if I don't want to release it, I don't, I'm not going to release it. So it's all on me, whether or not this ever sees the light of day. That was his condition. And they did it. You mean when they were recording at the time? 1,000%. Said, By the way, this doesn't ever go anywhere without me saying so. Correct. Why do you think it took 20 years? Right. Do you know what I mean? And for whatever reason, he felt the time was right. So now you've got all this footage that they can figure out the best way to present it and they did and it was outstanding and the music and the whole thing like if you if like you, i was like waiting for the next episode like i can't wait for the next episode like that's rare it doesn't always happen yeah it's just well done yeah man it was fascinating well let's we have to continue this conversation yes it'll it'll be a never-ending conversation yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up we'll wrap it up we'll wrap it i up. mean yeah it's been here for 22 hours i'm literally i went to bed i woke up and we're still here <laughs> <laughs> um but thanks for having me on this is great anytime yeah man um well you just said it you were documented saying anytime so we will have you back yeah and if you guys ever want to come fire off one in the studio absolutely are you kidding like I love Scotty, it. Scotty, uh, we want to bring Scotty, you know, but I, I'm actually Scotty, serious. Scotty, uh, that's a great idea. I mean, like if you. I, met, I thought you meant Scotty Khan. <laughs> Scotty, Scotty Khan. Sometimes like you might want to go, oh, we want to do this. Instead. If you ever want to do the studio, man, just come on down. I'm, I'm saying like anytime you want to use the thing and bounce the audio and take it to, you know, feel free if you ever want to, you know. Uh, we got to see the new digs. The new digs. Yeah. It used to be Maverick Records. Madonna's old. It's funny, oh. it's like, you can see it's like a recording studio. Of course, that's our lobby. We ironically, don't work, record in the one room that was meant to be a recording studio. But uh, we got a good space, so it's pretty cool. Got some, got some good energy in there. We'll see. Nice. Thanks. Thank you, man. Thanks for coming. Good stuff. Yeah, bro. How You Live in Jay Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. To leave a message for Jeremy, go to speakpipe.com slash jpiven. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in Jay Piven every Wednesday on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts.